What's going on everybody, it's Charles, and we are finally starting to embark on the Black R32 project. I've had this car for several months, now it's time to start tearing into it. In this video, we're going to be pulling the engine. This means the whole front end is going to come off. We'll probably pull the engine and transmission as one complete unit, and then separate the two with it on the ground. We'll of course have the all-wheel drive system to work around, and a handful of other things that are a little bit concerning to me, including prior workmanship, and of course, some of the rust issues that this car has. We got the parts shelf sitting right over there, so we'll be stacking up our old parts and getting prepared for an engine rebuild and a whole bunch of other things. So, uh, I don't know, let's get to work. I wanna start by draining all the fluids in the car. That way, they have plenty of time to drain out, especially since the car is cold. We wanna give this as much time as we possibly can. I might actually just use the extractor for the engine oil and drain the coolant out of the bottom. I also like to make sure that I keep the coolant and the oil separate so when we run to, say, advanced auto parts and recycle the oil, we don't have it mixed with coolant. It's also important to note, I had the refrigerant evacuated before starting this project. There's a local mobile guy that came and did it for me. For some reason, I just don't have the setup to do it here, but, Cool thing is I get to add that to the list of things to do. While we wait for that extractor to extract, let's go ahead and get the battery and air box and some of this other like really easy stuff to remove out. The battery is probably one of the only things not going on the parts shelf. I'm gonna set this on the other bench. That way we can plug it in and keep it on the trickle charger so I don't have to buy a new battery. Since we're here, we might as well just keep going and get some of the rest of this air box, battery tray. Look at that rusty old guy right there. Moving on to the bumper cover, let's start with the upper grill, and somehow, magically, I was able to get this upper grill off without breaking the hood pull. However, I don't think I'm gonna be so lucky going back together with it. Let's get the T30s that hold the bumper cover on the top side off next. And wouldn't you know, of course, the very first T30 I take out actually breaks, given the rusty condition of this car, not terribly surprising. And also on this bottom front one, the rivet nut started spinning, so I'm just gonna leave it in there. Good or bad, our bumper's actually pretty broken, which means we're gonna have some less fasteners to take off than we normally would. It also looks like someone had an issue with one of these fasteners at some point and ended up trying to drill it out or put the wrong fastener in. I'm not totally sure. Even when we look at, say, the fender liner or some of the under bolting of this bumper cover, a lot of it's either broken or missing. So we can actually take this bumper cover off pretty darn easy. When we analyze the overall condition of this core support, it might be easier just to go to the junkyard and get another one rather than trying to fix all these issues with this one. Next up, let's get this bumper and the core support out of the way. Before we start taking any bolts off, let's hit it with a dousing of rust penetrant to hopefully make our life a little bit easier. We're gonna be focusing on the bumper itself. We have the power steering cooler lines that run down the bottom across the front of the condenser. We'll get this foam bumper out of the way. And remember with those rusted fasteners, short blips of the trigger on your impact gun are going to make them so much easier coming out. This actually has two different style of fasteners. One that's machine cut that actually goes into a metal threaded, like a riv nut, for example. And some of them actually go into plastic. And usually the ones that go into plastic are quite a bit easier to take out. We're also going to be using our lollipops to hold the bumper itself on. Now, these lollipops, they work on the Mark IVs. It's not nearly as awesome as like the B5s and stuff like that that hold the whole entire core support up. This is just going to help get our bolts out and manage the weight of the bumper. Not a must-have tool, but really, they're nice to have in the toolbox. Don't forget to take off that hood latch cable from the hood latch. Next, let's unplug both of our headlights and unbolt the last couple bolts of our core support. Once it's loose, we can kind of wiggle the condenser and radiator and fan assembly out of the core support, get the core support out of the car, and set it to the side. Next, we're gonna undo the upper radiator hose. Now, we're probably gonna lose a little more coolant, so I still have our coolant catcher underneath the radiator. We're also going to need to disconnect the electrical connectors for the fans, and so that I don't have to take the condenser separate from the radiator assembly or just leave the condenser hanging, I'm gonna disconnect the condenser from the receiver dryer as well as from the AC compressor. Now, even though I had this evacuated already, there's always the opportunity for a little bit of refrigerant to be left in the system. So if you're gonna take off that first AC connection, Make sure you're being safe, keep your face out of the direction of fire, and of course, be sure you have your safety glasses on. 
Now we can go ahead and get all that stuff out of the way. And oh, hey, do me a favor. Give props to the kiddo. She's making her filming debut here in this scene. I think she nailed it. What do you think? As you can see, we have this rat's nest of hoses and pipes and a secondary air pump and all kinds of crazy stuff. I wanna get as much of this out of the way as I possibly can. My goal here though, is to try and have this as few pieces as possible. We're gonna probably delete secondary air anyway, so I'm not super worried about that. But all these coolant lines, I wanna take them out in as few pieces as I can. By doing that, we have better odds of it all going back together quite a bit easier. There's also probably some rogue coolant left in these hoses, so we're going to make sure that we don't take a coolant bath while we're doing this. We're also gonna get rid of our secondary air pump, and like I said, that's probably not gonna go back in. We also want to loosen up and remove anything that's holding on our power steering lines because that runs in front of the transmission and up over the top. So we're gonna need to get that out of the way completely in order to get this engine and transmission assembly out. Something that I'm trying to do as we go along is secure the hoses and stuff so that I don't have a giant leaky mess the entire time this car is taken down. Something I really like to do, a big fan of, is to take a glove. Now these are actually way too big, so it's perfect. Put the hose end in a glove and then either tape or zip tie it on. That way, what little bit of drippy fluid that might come out gets trapped in the glove instead of all over your floor. So now there'll still be a little bit of fluid, but it'll all land in this glove instead of just dripping everywhere. Next, let's deal with some of this stuff on top of the transmission. Some of it we can leave attached, like the starter, for example, but we do have a lot of wiring that we need to deal with. We have our hard pipe for our power steering, our shifter cables, and some more coolant lines, believe it or not. For the sheer sake of making it easier to get to some of the stuff behind the engine, like the prop shaft and like the exhaust manifolds, let's go ahead and get the subframe out of the way. Luckily on the Mark IVs and really most VWs, this is super duper easy and it's worth taking those 10 or so bolts out. Unfortunately, one of the bolts for the power steering rack on the driver's side actually broke while I was taking it out. It's not a huge deal, but it made me notice that there was another bolt that was broken on the power steering rack on the driver's side. We'll of course have to address that. Because that bolt was broke, I had to take the bolt out for the front sway bar in order to get the power steering rack around the sway bar. Here you go, check it out. One broken bolt, two broken bolts. Clearly that one towards the front is the one that I broke. This one's been broken a while. You can tell because it's so rusted. So we'll, uh, uh, we'll have to deal with that, of course. Looks like worst case we can press that threaded piece out and maybe just do a bolt and a nut. That is a part of the power steering rack, so I don't want it to get too terribly unhappy. Luckily though, all the body bolts came out no problem. We'll leave this power steering rack kind of chill here while we work on some of this stuff right up in here. Next, let's get both of our axles unbolted from our transmission, 12 triple square bolts in total, and we'll use a couple of reusable zip ties to secure them up. You really don't wanna leave these axle joints just hanging. All right, we got a whole bunch of stuff undone at this point. We have our front axles disconnected, both left side and right side. We have the bolts to our prop shaft loose. It's still kind of up there. Uh, we'll just need to slide the engine assembly forward. And we'll do that as we pull the engine out. Our next task is the task of tasks, dealing with our downpipes, headers, and whatnot. I'm pretty sure at this point, I'm going to take the three bolts on each side for the downpipes out, leave the headers attached to the cylinder head. That way I can do those on the bench. We're not going back with the same headers or the same downpipe. So whether those studs break or not, I don't really care. As long as the nuts don't strip, that's really the only thing I'm worried about. And if they do, we can always just cut them off. But as you can see, there ain't a whole ton of room. So if I don't have to cut stuff off up there, I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm good with that. All right, let's see how much of an unhappy time these bad boys are gonna give us. Sometimes you gotta break out the big guns in order to get to that hard to reach spot. Next, let's get the exhaust manifold dealt with. Really, I'm just gonna take it out from the downpipe leave the manifolds attached to the cylinder head. A tip, when doing stuff like this on super rusted things, 
An impact gun can be your friend, but if you just full throttle send it coming out, you're probably gonna break the bolt. Blips of the trigger, that's where the magic is. I hope, anyway. Oh, that came right out. I feel like that's a hint of overconfidence. Well, the whole stud came out and I'm okay with that. Woo, she's smoking. And the final nut. Well, they all came out. Two of them, the whole stud came out, which is totally fine because we're not putting those manifolds back in anyway. So doesn't matter. Awesome. That was one of the parts I was most worried about. I'm super happy that came out the way it did. Next, let's move on to getting the cowl out of the way and we gotta get our wiper blades out of the way. Depending on the age and the condition of the car, sometimes if you take the caps off for the wiper arms, loosen that 13 millimeter nut and then press down on it a few times, it'll come loose pretty easily. Given the crustacean of this car, I have zero expectation of that. What we're gonna do is we're gonna put some rust penetrant down and then let that soak in a little bit. Odds are we'll have to use our wiper arm removal tool. What a lot of people also use is a battery terminal removal tool, but uh, I like this one. This one works pretty well. It's a little bulky to fit around the plastic of the cowl trim, but it gets the job done. This is a pretty small piece and uh, it actually kind of bugs your hand to twist it hard. If you take a small deep well socket on an extension, not only does it protect your hand, but you get a little bit more leverage. And just like that, and if we did it right, and don't put the arm back on, Charles. We did it right, our arm should come off pretty darn easily. And we'll of course do the exact same thing for the other side. Then we'll take our trim tool, slide it underneath the plastic cowl trim between the trim and the windshield, and remove our cowl trim. With our cowl trim off, we can see that we had some kind of critters doing some kind of something down in here. Not to mention, look at all the leaves and debris up underneath this cowl trim. This is another common source of water leaks because the drains get clogged up. Oh, and check it out. The pollen filter is not hooked in at the back. Not a big deal. And we'll take care of that as we put everything back together. But at least now we have access to our ECM connector and we can get some of these wires out of the way. My goal is to leave as much together as possible. So disconnect the alternator cable. We got the connector for the starter we need to unplug. Little clip difficulty, not that big a deal. And the reverse light switch. So electronically we are separated here. Next we'll disconnect the clutch slave cylinder. I'm gonna go ahead and just spray that down. Spray both sides, why not? Get our 90 degree pick. And you wanna make sure you're capturing this. This is gonna leak brake fluid and we don't wanna leak brake fluid all over the place. So capture that. There we go. If ever you have a retaining clip like this, don't leave it up, leave it locked. That way if for some reason something gets weird, the clip won't go flying off. And we're gonna use our old glove trick and make sure that we don't get brake fluid all over the place. Even though what I'm about to do next is probably not like a necessary step, I'm gonna pull the intake manifold. I think overall it's just gonna make working and getting the stuff off the backside of the manifold and underneath it way easier to get to. I also think it's gonna be easier when we get our engine hoist on to kind of manage the engine without this big giant bit of plastic right here in front. And it's pretty easy access, so why not? Ooh, that one wasn't even tight. Ooh, that one didn't feel good at all. That one felt rounded out. <laughs> no, that one wasn't even tight. That one wasn't tight either. Come on, people. Tighten down your bolts. That one is not happy. Ugh, I knew it. I felt that one coming. All right, well, might as well get our <laughs> dipstick out of the way here. Good Lord. <laughs> All right, I guess that's staying. So we had one bolt break right here and then the upper bolt at the back here in the intake runner is stripped. 
out, the head of the Allen is kind of stripped out. I have an idea on what to do first in the hopes that this doesn't get super unhappy. What we're gonna do is we're gonna line it up as best we can and tap it in with some gentle loving. Yes, yes, that is what we wanted to have happen. Let's take a closer look at this Allen that was kind of boogered up. You can see somebody did some unhappy things. What, uh, one of two things happened. Either they didn't get it fully in when they were loosening it or tightening it. The last time this manifold was off, because remember this car's had chains. Or they used a cheap, poor quality ball end at Allen, number six Allen, and that rounded it out. Ball end Allens are one of the places where if you don't buy the best quality one, you might as well not use one at all. Yay! Still got something caught. You get off there. Ugh. All right, let's put this up somewhere safe. Fuel lines. I'm going to take them off at the fuel rail since I got to take them off the fuel rail <laughs> anyway. Uh, and that way we can just leave them in the car. One less thing to worry about. Bum, 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 bum. That smells like old fuel. Next, we got to deal with this sort of rat's nest going on back here. A lot of this stuff over on this side, this metal bracket and the stuff attached to it, that's going to stay in the car. I don't need to take all that stuff off. I only need to remove the stuff that's still attached to the engine, which is one coolant hose here and one coolant hose at the coolant flange. We also need to unbolt the bracket here and over here, which should. Don't say it, Charles. I want to say it should be easy but I shouldn't say it, but I think it's too late. I already said it. All right, so now all this whole mess can stay in the car. We don't have to deal with it. We do have to deal with power steering though. All right, we got a lot of stuff taken off this engine. I think we got one final part and that is this refrigerant line from the compressor. And I think once we get that out of the way and detached, I think we can start unbolting our engine and transmission. Well, it is time. We are down to four bolts left that we need to take out in order to get the engine and transmission assembly out of the car. Uh, those four bolts are two bolts for the engine mount and two bolts for the transmission mount. What I think I'm gonna do is lower the car down quite a bit. I'm gonna take a floor jack up underneath the transmission, lift up on it a little bit, unbolt the mount, drop the transmission down some. Then I'm gonna take one of those bolts that was in the transmission mount hook my chain to there, hook my chain to the other side on the engine where there's an eyelet that you actually are supposed to hook your, uh, your engine hoist up to, bring the engine up a little bit to fully support it with the weight of the chain, and then uh, unbolt the engine on the engine side and the passenger side, and then, uh, yeah, then we're probably going to pull the engine away a little bit, we'll raise the car up, we'll set the engine down, kind of regroup, then I have a mount that we'll put on it to mount the VR6 up to the engine stand because we want that on the, what when it's facing transverse like this, we want that on the backside. All right, we got the engine, the transmission, and the bevel box down on the ground. Actually, it's on one of these little rolly platforms which makes life quite a bit easier. All in all, not a horrible job. A handful of things to recap that we're gonna have to deal with going forward. Next video is going to be a tear down of the engines. We'll separate the engine and transmission and bevel box. We'll tear the engine all the way down and see what else we might need beside the things that we know we need for this turbo setup. Also, the things that we're gonna have to deal with are the broken bolts in the power steering rack, the prop shaft. Ugh, that's the one that I'm really not looking forward to. I'm sure we can massage that metal to get it a little bit more rounded and replace that bushing Maybe, maybe not. The worst case scenario is we have to put a new prop shaft in it, which isn't the end of the world. It's just 15, 16, 1700 bucks, whatever that I didn't plan on spending. Probably also going to have to get the subframe back in so we can get the car on the ground and get it back out of the shop. Do some thorough washing of the engine compartment. If I were a smarter man, I would have backed it onto the lift and we could have just done it in the shop. Why didn't I think of that till just now? What the heck? That's the whole point of having the drain in the shop. Anyway, we'll be doing that, of course. I guess we could still do it, but it'd, it'd make a big old mess. So more awesome things coming. With that, I'm out. Thank you guys for 
for watching. Don't forget to make sure you're subscribed with your notifications on so that you get an alert when the next video drops because that one is going to be a really cool one of tearing down a VR6 with 216,000 miles. So with that, I am out. Have an awesome day, and I'll talk to you again next time. Bye-bye.